everyone and welcome or welcome back to Playing as Pages. Today we're talking about the poem The Good Morrow by John Donne. Welcome to my new series on John Donne's poetry. This is a series that is aimed at those taking the A-level English literature exam who are doing the John Donne blog, but as we progress I'm hoping to put in more metaphysical poets as well and make this a metaphysical poetry section on my channel. So I hope you will be as excited as I am and let's dive into the summary. So in this beautiful Obad by John Donne, one of the metaphysical poets, he paints the picture of the two lovers waking up together the morning after. The feelings they have about each other, their life before they met each other, and their life now. The way that love transforms them, the way that love is all powerful, the way that love builds a new world and defies the laws of the existing one. The speaker says that he has never truly lived until he has met this woman. Never Never known the true meaning of life until he has met her. Suddenly everything makes sense. He sees in her true beauty that he has dreamed of his whole life. And now they only need each other. They create a world where they don't need anybody but the two of them. They balance them themselves. They balance each other out. It references back to Platonic ideals, which we'll discuss in more depth in a second. And also, they are soulmates, and because their love balances them them out, they can live healthily and for a long time. A few notes on the structure first before we begin with the line-by-line -line analysis. So this is an obit, a genre of poetry declared at morning to a lover. You may be more familiar with the serenade, which is the same thing but at night. Rhythm is mostly iambic pentameter. It's occasionally broken up by iambic hexameter or the alexandrine. So there is a three stanza st um, structure here. It will become quite familiar with John Donne's poetry as we progress, and it's a famous structure because it references, well, a bunch of things really. Three is a highly significant number. There is, of course, the beginning, the middle, the age, then in religion, the holy trinity, man, heaven, purgatory. It could also reference in rhetoric the rule of three and the idea that three arguments are the surest and the strongest way to convince someone to join your side. This is quite a conversational poem, and we should be wary of looking too much into contextual factors. It's important to mention that at the time, a lot of poems that were written were written by the poets for themselves or for a group of intimate friends. They were not really meant to be published, and they were published po posthumously usually, so they tended to be quite personal. If you wanted to look into this deeper on a con contextual side, Dunn was a lawyer and he trained to be a lawyer. And of course there was this a lot of emphasis on Latin and the use of rhetoric. And this whole poem kind of mirrors the same structure that you would expect from a rhetorical speech, which I think was part of the criticism that Samuel Johnson said he of the dictionary fame, he did not like metaphysical poets, and he argued that their poems better survive the test of the finger rather than the, the test of the ear. So he essentially said that they don't really sound good and that they're poems in name alone. So the structure would certainly support that a little bit there if you wanted to argue that. The rhyme scheme is mostly ABAB, although it may not sound like it, and this is partly because the pronunciation changed. For example, um, like, I childishly does not sound the same now, but it likely would have been back then. But we're about to see this in more depth, so let's get into the line-by-line -line analysis. I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly, or started we in the seven sleepers' den? Twas so, but this, all oh pleasures fancy be, if ever any beauty I did see, which I desired, and God, twas but a dream of thee. I wonder by my troth. So troth is actually the archaic expression of by my truth and betrothed actually comes from there, like I swear by my truth. So if you, again, if you wanted to look at this from a contextual perspective, at this point in his life, Dunn probably met Anne Moore. This is the woman that he, by the way, gave up everything for, the very traditional romantic notion of like, I would literally give up everything for you because well, he quite literally did. He lost his job, he lost his fame, um, 
it was just people did not approve of this marriage but he really deeply fell in love with her she utterly stole his heart so you could interpret this poem as being devoted by her and betrothed could be a reference to the fact that they actually secretly eloped but again maybe reading too much into this because bet by by my trust was actually quite a common expression of the time what thou and i did till we loved in other words what possible occupation did we have what possible things to do did we have that were important until we met each other Thou is of course the more intimate form and it highlights what it feels like a poem for one set of years only and there's this assurer right in the middle of this uh, comma what thou and I and then split did till we loved line four is end stop so there's uh, quite a lot of natural breaking of rhythm within this poem and I think it's because Don doesn't really want us to settle into a comfortable lull he doesn't want this to become just another pretty love poem that you think oh it's nice sounds nice and then you forget um rather he wants to highlight that this love is not like other love he is still working things out for himself he's on a process of self-discovery he's a changed man love transforms and there's an instability a, volunt a volatility in love and passion and he wants to represent this with the unsteady rhythm were we not weaned till then but sucked on country pleasures childishly so weaned is the moment when a baby is forced to stop suckling on a mother's breast and i think this is very much a double entendre uh if we go back to my Hamlet series and we talked about country pleasures before so essentially country pleasures again a dirty pun country it's exactly what you think that it is and the use of sucked and country and ween this lexical field it's very much intentional and a lot of Dunn's poems were quite naughty so I don't think I'm reading too much into this when I say that it's a double entendre if you wanted to read this innocently though you could take country to be like rural affairs so like farming, um, gardening, uh, being preoccupied with domestic mundanity in other words because he wants to highlight here that like his life before he met her was nothing. We were preoccupied with childish things, this adverb childishly. It's the politics, the busy home life rather than the true seriousness of life, love. So we were but children and uh, before this, we before we lost our innocence, we never really truly understood what the point of love was. Uh, before we of course had this night and met each other or snorted we in the seven sleepers den so snorted is actually the archaic form of uh, snored and this is referring to the like the sleep the seven sleepers which is a religious tale that is found in the bible but also in a lot of other religious books i am told there was this emperor called Decius, I think his name is pronounced, and he was persecuting the Christians, and there were these seven soldiers, and they decided to hide out until people stopped persecuting them. So they went into this cave, and then they slept for 187 years, and when the cave was reopened, of course, everybody expected them to be dead, but like no it was a whole miracle and they woke up and they went to the new emperor and they told their story and then right after they told their story they died the whole point was that it's a miracle that they lived for so long but also when they woke up they really took off the veil from people's eyes who didn't really realize the true miracle of god that is basically the moral of the story it's the metaphor here is that they slept for a really long time and now they've woken up to the true meaning of life and that love is a miracle and when they found each other it's the ultimate romantic notion of i have not known love till i met you it was so but this all pleasures fancy be but this except for this layer laying together our pleasures be fancies be everything else was but a dream something insubstantial something you should not care about our only only our love is truly truly effective if ever any beauty i did see which i desired and got twas but a dream of thee so and got makes it the 12 syllable line the alexandrine and he's essentially saying that like any woman i had before you pales in comparison and also i love in particular that he has this if ever any beauty i did see which i desired and caught the and got is very pointed but at least he's being quite honest about the fact that don was like a big playboy for lack of other words yes darling i slept with a lot of women but 
it was all in preparation for you. I now realize that it was all just like entertainment and you're the true pleasure, you're my true spiritual fulfillment. So we see this promise of I've settled down, my love, uh, realized in the microcosm created in the second stanza. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear. For love, O oh love, of other sights controls, and makes one little room in everywhere. Let sea discoverers to new worlds have gone, let maps to other, worlds on worlds have shown. Let us possess one world, each has one and is one. So now, rather than addressing the lover, it almost seems like he's talking to the rest of us within the stanza. It's a declaration to the public that they, like he and his lover, are the ones who create this world. Good morrow. So that's actually good morning. And we now see that this is referring to the morning after for sure. Because like when we first read the title, we could have just assumed that it's like, oh, just like a normal greeting, but no. And again, it's a play on words. It's both the innocent greeting of like, have a happy day, um, I'm so glad you've woken up, and also, of course, the romantic and very intimate morning after that people don't really talk about because it's like considered very sensitive and private and between lovers. Again, highlighting that originally this was probably intended to be a very private poem. They wake up after a shared night to our waking souls, to our souls that have just woken up. This poem is devoted to them and to their souls. And our souls are watching each other asleep or awake, not because we are scared out of fear, but for love. So for love. Again, this is what I wanted to talk about when I wanted to talk about the reference back to Plato. It's the literal idea of soulmates. Soul split into two becoming mates. So the idea was that essentially like when you came into this earth you had one soul but then it split into two. You are never really complete. You're never really self-fulfilled because you're missing your other half and your only chance to really truly find love and not just like a temporary occupation, someone to fill your days with happiness instead of boredom is that you have one true soulmate and they're the actual other half of your soul so like when you unite together then you'll know that you've reached self-fulfillment basically is the idea so he's saying that they found their other halves for love oh love of other sides control essentially it's saying that now that they found their other half they realize that all of their senses were muted before and now love is the ultimate one out of all their senses sight uh hearing taste touch whatever it all pales in comparison to love and he also it's also this idea that when you love you don't really feel anything else so it's the rose colored glasses truly they just they don't see the flaws the room is now a microcosm of the world they create their own worldly affairs makes one little room and everywhere so their whole room is the world and their world is their room. The next three lines are a repetition of let us. So it's actually the form from Latin, I believe, the conjunctivus et correctivus, which is essentially a call to action. And I think that Don would have been, Don would have been um, very familiar with this Latin grammar construction because of his legal background. Uh, and in general, educated men tended to have a good grasp of the Latin language. So this is a grammar structure that typically acts as a call to action in, for example, like, a mammoth patrium, like, let us love the fatherland, things like that. So it's urging someone to join your noble cause. And he kind of defies the rules here because he says that, yeah, he's urging people to do their cause, but he doesn't really, like, think that it's noble. He doesn't really, he isn't urging them to join it with him. He's essentially saying that let them do whatever they want, let them join whatever they want. I am happy with the woman that I love. Let the cartographers draw the maps of the new worlds, maps to others. Let the sea discoverers discover the new worlds have gone to, to leave to whatever country they want. We have our own world. Let us possess one world. Each has one and is one. We also see 
for the first time a repetition of pronouns like us the first person plural it suggests unity before there was mostly i or thou uh, it's from me the speaker the persona the romantic lover addressed to you the woman that i love and then now we have us the repetition of one it let us let us um let maps to others others us they them it's very much us in our own world against everybody else and it shows us how their souls have united that there's a unity now that has been completed once they have found their soulmate again this idea that you have reached true fulfillment my face in thine eye thine in mine appears and true plain hearts do in the faces rest where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north without declining west whatever dies was not mixed equally if our two loves be one or thou and i love so alike that none do slacken none can die my face in thine eye thine in mine appears so this refers to that moment when you look into someone's eye and you're so close to them that you can see your own reflection and this moment is always an intimate one because it requires for your face to be like up close to someone for you to share that minute of examining yourself in their eyes it's that idea of like seeing yourself the way that they see you and true plain hearts do in their faces rest so through their eyes you can see their emotion their openness their honesty and if you're in that position you're not just in that position with any random person you're in a position with someone that you can trust and this person doesn't really have to hide their true face around you hide their true emotions they can be themselves around you so uh it means it's it's again kind of referencing what these two lovers feel about each other, the honesty that they feel towards each other. These lovers are so intimate. Everything is written on their face freely. Uh, this line here is monosyllabic as well. It's important to mention all the words are just one syllable. There's nothing complicated here. It's very clear. And again, it highlights that likewise, their connection is just straightforward and clear there's nothing there to unpick nothing there that's confounding and confusing it's very straightforward the fact is they love each other where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north without declining west so this is again the idea of two halves making a whole and this is a conceit where he describes them as two hemispheres so two hemispheres are halves of a sphere of a 3d circle and he's essentially saying that when you join their two parts they make a whole they make a world and um they make a better world is the crucial part here the better hemispheres because they have no sharp north, meaning it's only the south, it's never cold, it's always warm, no declining west. I know declining west sounds like something the propaganda would say, but um, declining west is actually referring to like this idea that the sun goes down in the west, like declines in the west, so uh, it's the east that's rising, so... In other words, he's saying it's always sunny in our world, that's why we're better. Very romantic, but at the same time, it's quite scientific. Um, you'll see a similar one with Dunn's poem about compasses. Uh, so it is quite interesting. Um, it's an unusual comparison and it really, really does stick, which I think distinguishes it. It's the idea of like what distinguishes a conceit from a metaphor is really a complicated one and a topic for a whole other video perhaps but at this stage in its simplest terms it's just an unusual metaphor and i think that from this comparison the fact that it's not something you would usually think of and it's not usually something romantic that's what kind of makes it a conceit that's what distinguishes it here so on to the last line split into three lines it's almost like a separate triplet again this coming back to the beginning, the middle, the end, whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I, love so alike that none do slack and none can die, mixed equally. So this is a reference to the medical idea of the time, which we talked about in my video on the fourth turning, the idea of the balance of humors. Everybody has humors like yellow bile, black bile, other ones. And if they're in disbalance, that's when you are sick. 
or excessively emotional or excessively angry. And it's these that make you sick. So if you amend that, then you won't be sick. And he's saying that the only way to amend that is through, of course, finding your other half, becoming in balance again, matching up. And because you'll be healthy, non do slacken, you won't feel sick, and non can die. You will basically live forever. You'll be immortalized because of your love. So, and it also, he also says here, our love is so alike that if our two loves were united, we would be the same. So again, when we join together, we make each other stronger. It's a hyperbole, but again, it's a very romantic one. It's the ultimate promise. So with that, that concludes my mini study guide of the poem. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you will enjoy this series. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you soon.